The second church message is to the church in Smyrna and the subject, a very serious and important one, satanic opposition. Satanic opposition. It starts at verse 8 of chapter 2 and goes down to verse 11, so follow along as I read these four verses for tonight's message on satanic opposition, Revelation 2, 8 to 11. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, who is dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devils shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Will you join me please in prayer? Father in heaven, what a joy it is to come and sing your praises and to worship you from our hearts. Lord, you're the God of all comfort and all power. You're the God of peace. You're the God of forgiveness. You're the God of grace and mercy. It is your character, Father, to be gracious unto your children. You're ever mindful that we are but dust. Father, we know that none of us are worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive the glory and honor and power and dominion and blessing forever and ever. And we recognize, Father, our unworthiness. And we recognize, Father, our need of standing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and him alone. And we thank you, Lord, for your care and compassion and concern for us. As evidenced by your message to the church at Smyrna, you know what we're going through. And Lord, you know those who have come in here tonight with great burden, with great need. There's so many people that are hurt, suffering deep trouble and pain. But you're the God who has said to us that one day you will wipe away all tears from our eyes. One day there'll be no more sorrow, no more suffering, nor crying or pain or death, for the former things will be wiped away. And you'll make everything brand new. And Lord, I thank you that in the midst of our trials, we can know your peace. You tell us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials and temptations, knowing that the trying of our faith is working patience, patience, experience, and experience hope that never makes us ashamed. Thank you for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that some of us are discouraged, defeated, absolutely not knowing where to turn or where to go next. Lord, I'm thankful to you that you know the way that we take. You know the end from the beginning. You know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, if this is that sweet day when you take all of your children home, we pray that every one of us in this auditorium would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Everyone would really know the Lord. Oh God, we pray that we might really know the one who is being revealed in this great book of Revelation, our Lord Jesus Christ. May we fall at his feet and worship him again and cry out, my Lord and my God, as Thomas did of old. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I mentioned the joy of visiting the seven churches of Revelation, and it certainly is an eye-opener. We gave you a number of indications of that in our last message together. Smyrna is another example. Smyrna is a modern city on the coast of uh, western Turkey on the Aegean Sea. Today it's called Izmir, and it has over 200,000 inhabitants. It's not a small city. 
And it's a beautiful city, a seaport town, and it was beautiful in the day in which John wrote. Let me tell you a little bit about Smyrna because I think it's fundamental to understanding the message that we've entitled Satanic Opposition. The Romans called this city the beauty of Asia, and they also referred to it as a city of life and strength. It's about 35 miles north of Ephesus, a beautiful drive. It's a seaport, as I mentioned. It's a beautiful-looking city, even from the sea. Uh, I've been on a boat, a cruise ship, that has gone by the front of Smyrna, and looking back on that city in the hills is indeed a beautiful sight. It's still prospering today. In 195 B.C., so this puts it quite a bit ahead of our uh, historical background here of chapter 2, for that was written about 90 to 95 A.D., but in 195 B.C., they erected a temple to the goddess of Rome and supported the Roman Republic. Now remember, the empire doesn't start until 30 B.C., under Augustus Caesar on the Pax Romana, the Roman peace that dominated the entire world. Caesar Augustus, by the way, was Octavian. Those of you who've either seen in a movie or read a book about Cleopatra and Mark Antony and Julius Caesar and, and Octavian, Octavian was the least likely to succeed. He was kind of wimpish and was a homosexual. But uh, Octavian, because uh, of uh, maneuvering um, and a little political intrigue winds up being uh, Rome's greatest emperor, Augustus Caesar. And uh, so in 195 BC, uh, Smyrna, a long time before Augustus was on the throne, erected a temple simply to the goddess of Rome. Uh, they became dedicated to the Roman Republic, which had started back about 705 BC and didn't become an empire, as I said, till about 30 BC. So they were loyal even when Rome was not in full control. Smyrna became a seat of emperor worship. Uh, and in 26 AD, when several cities were uh, competing for the honor of building a temple to Emperor Tiberius, Smyrna was given that privilege. So it gives you an idea of kind of the history backlog of loyalty to Rome. Uh, it has an interesting uh, archaeological fact about it, it has a theater that seats over 20,000 people uh, from the time of, of John. Now they had a very famous street in Smyrna called the Golden Street. It's interesting, uh, in heaven we're told the, the streets are of gold. But Smyrna had a golden street. It started at the seaport and went all the way up to the Acropolis, which is on top of Mount Pegasus, which is there in Smyrna. And let me just tell you what was along that, sea, that uh, street at the time John wrote this letter. Right at the seaport, um, when you just got off the boat, the first thing you'd see is this beautiful, luxurious temple to the goddess Sibele. Further up the road, as you continue on your journey, you come to a gorgeous temple that they tell us was really something to see, a temple to Apollo, the god of war. You go on a little further and you come to a very famous temple that we'll learn about more next week that was at Pergamos called the Temple of Esculapius, who was the god of healing and was pictured by a serpent. More about that next week. Beyond that, you will come to a monument to Homer. Yes, the same Homer who wrote all those works in Greek history. Uh, he was from Smyrna. And finally, you'll come up on the top to a giant temple to Zeus, who is the chief god of the Greek pantheon, and that'd be sitting on the Acropolis or on the mountain, which is called Mount Pegasus. Alexander the Great uh, and his successors were so impressed with this city, they wanted to rebuild it as the model city and to make it the most beautiful city in the world. So even at the time of John, it is prosperous, it is beautiful, it is stunning to see it from the sea and uh, to observe its golden street and all of these luxurious temples. There was also a large colony of Jews who lived there and they had considerable influence on the civic authorities. Uh, years later, after the writing of this letter to the church at Smyrna, these same Jews joined with Gentiles to form a mob and call for the death of the pastor of the church in Smyrna, whose name was Polycarp. And he was a disciple of the Apostle John, literally sat at his feet and learned from him. Two church historians and fathers called Tertullian and Irenaeus 
tell us that Polycarp was a bishop at the time of this letter, which is very interesting. That John not only discipled him, but appointed him to that task. Now this letter is about suffering and persecution. And some of you probably know the story, but on February 22nd, 166 AD, Polycarp was burned at the stake as an old man, nearing 100 years old. He spoke of serving the Lord for 86 years. In fact, his famous statement has been recorded and is in a lot of books on this matter. Polycarp said as they were burning him to the stake and demanding that he say, Caesar is Lord and renounce his belief that Jesus is Lord, he said, this old man, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who loved me so? Bring on the flames. Well, Rome thought they would be done with Christianity, hardly. What they had to do as a result of Polycarp's testimony is they had to martyr and slaughter and kill. Uh, we were told that the blood flowed down Mount Pegasus. They slaughtered 1,500 people at one shot. And a little bit later, they had to slaughter another 800 more of the Christians who were inspired by the example of Polycarp and decided that there was nothing that anyone could do to them that uh, would cause them to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. They died as martyrs. Interesting that uh, the name of this city in the New Testament, Smyrna, comes from the word myrrh. Uh, myrrh gives off a sweet smell only after it's crushed. The meaning, therefore, was bitter, and it's used as an allegory frequently, even in the Bible. And the point is that it refers to the result of suffering and trial. That a sweet smell in the nostrils of God, a sweet aroma comes forth from those who suffer for his name's sake. If we suffer, the Bible says, we shall reign with him. Now myrrh is from a balsam herb that uh, you get spices and medicine from. It comes from the resin gum. And it is used also uh, in ancient times as a drug to relieve pain and the agony of people who are dying. You remember in Mark 15, 23, that Jesus on the cross was given myrrh. It was like a drug to alleviate pain. It was also used in embalming. And you remember from John chapter 19, verse 38 to 40, that myrrh was a part of the spices used in the embalming process of the body of Jesus. How fitting. And you'll also remember that when Jesus was born, and uh, as a young child, possibly close to two years old, when the wise men finally showed up, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How interesting that these wise men from the east would bring the very uh, plant and spice that pictures death. It's almost prophetically like they understood that he was the king because they brought him gold. He was a priest because they brought the frankincense that was used only uh, in the temple uh, worship. Uh, to fill the temple with smoke and also to remove the stench of blood that was everywhere by animal sacrifice. It was also a picture of the prayers of God's people going up to heaven. And they brought frankincense. He was a priest, is a priest, whoever li lives to intercede for us. But they also brought myrrh, indicating that he was going to die. And that indeed he did for our sins. So it's kind of fascinating just thinking of the name of the city and that this message deals with suffering and Statements about death. In the letter to the church at Ephesus, we learned that the first mark of the New Testament church is love for God himself. The second mark from Smyrna is the ability to suffer and endure, which is really a demonstration of how effective and strong our love for the Lord really is. Jesus said in John 15, 18 to 20, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So don't be surprised, wrote Peter, at the fiery trials that come to you as though some strange thing has happened. For the Bible teaches that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's what the Bible teaches. 
Tertullian, the great church historian, who witnessed personally many martyrdoms at Rome in his early 20s, he wrote these words. He said, if the Tiber, referring to the Tiber River, if the Tiber has overflowed its banks, if the Nile has remained in its bed, if the sky has been still, or the earth been in commotion, if death has made its devastations or famine its afflictions, your cry immediately is, this is the fault of the Christians. All through those early years, Christians were suffering for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Smyrna, as a seat of emperor worship, demanded that every citizen would come once a year and burn incense on a giant altar and proclaim that Caesar is Lord. I'm sorry to tell you that many, many Christians did it. They did it and said, what difference does it make? I don't really believe it. Let's just do it, and that way we won't suffer any problems. But there were hundreds and hundreds of Christians who refused to do it and died for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For Caesar is not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord of all. So there's much admonition for all of us, especially in the time in which we live. In preparation for this message, I decided to do a little bit of study about what's happened in this century. I think it's easy for us to remove ourselves out of a passage and not see its relevance, or to be living in a culture that is protected. My friends, the truth of the matter is more people have died for their faith in Jesus Christ in the 20th century than all previous years of church history. No, the message is quite relevant. We forget that even under Joseph Stalin, 30 million people were killed, and we have been told by history the majority of them believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. 30 million. The truth of the matter is people are dying all over. People are imprisoned for their faith in Jesus Christ. Cultures of the world, uh, many of them uh, are uh, opposed to Christianity and are persecuting Christians today. But I want to say to all of us who live in this North American culture that it is happening here, and you know it. The hostility is growing. At a recent uh, conference on those who call themselves global futurists, a speaker said at that conference held here in Los Angeles, the major problem in petting our progress our fundamental Christians who believe the Bible is God's word. These people are the real problem in society, keeping us from advancing to the objectives of the new world order. I want to say I accept that badge willingly, and I am glad to be a part of those who oppose you. There are terrible things happening in America right now. Terrible things. Our freedoms are going out the window. Who knows what the years, if the Lord tarries just ahead of us, are going to mean to all of us. Perhaps our society will face what so many societies face. We are already a minority. Don't kid yourself. And out of all those who call themselves Christians, I seriously doubt that many of them are truly born again. For an example... In the last decade, George Gallup did a poll in which he argued that there were 50 million born-again evangelical Christians in our culture. But about 10 years later, taking the same names and calling them a random sampling in several major cities, discovered that only one out of four knew anything about the major doctrines of salvation. On some estimates from current research, some are saying that the number of true born-again believers who know what the Bible teaches about salvation are as low as 10 to 15 million people. I do not know. I don't know the accuracy of any of this. All I know is what Jesus said. In the last day, many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And he will say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. It's a serious matter. I want you to notice four things about Jesus Christ in this message of four verses. One, who he is. 
Two, what he knows. Three, what he commands. And four, what he promises. Real simple. Who he is, what he knows, what he commands, and what he promises. Now let's look at who he is. Verse 8. Interesting that there were two characteristics of the risen Christ mentioned in chapter 1 that are brought to our attention. These things saith the first and the last, so he is the eternal God, and we'll confirm that here just in a moment with scripture, and who was dead and is alive, so he's the resurrected Lord. How crucial that that statement would be given to a church that's going to experience martyrdom. This message to this church came between 90 and 95 AD, and before 170 AD, this church has experienced enormous suffering and pain, and hundreds and hundreds of believers were killed and martyred in this same city. The very pastor who received this message from John, who trained at his feet and was his disciple, will be called on to suffer at the stake as an old man. Interesting. Who is he? He's the eternal God, the first and the last. Go back to Isaiah again and look at chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. There's no doubt about it. The first and the last refers to the eternal God. And this title is given to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who he is. He is God. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Isaiah 41, verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. The word Lord, Lord the Hebrew word Yahweh, Jehovah. I, the Lord, the first and the last. Turn to chapter 44, verse 6. Chapter 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, that's the word Jehovah, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no what? God. So clearly it's a term referring to God. By the way, this is a great verse to use with those who wear white shirts, long ties and ride bicycles. Amen. Amen. It's a great verse to use. Why? Several years ago, in a um, confrontation with a Jehovah Witness leader who had started 17 Kingdom Halls, and we spent about two years arguing with one another, praise God, he came to Christ. He's an independent pastor now of a Bible teaching church. But anyway, at that time, uh, we were having a rather hostile uh, conversation when we met. But this one passage just bothered him to no end. The first time I introduced it to him, he said, well, if you knew Hebrew, you would know that that's no problem to us. And I said, why is that? He said, well, there are two words for Lord in Hebrew. One is Jehovah and one is Adonai. So the first one is Jehovah, King of Israel. That's the Father. And the Redeemer, of course, we know is the Messiah. And that's Adonai, the second word. Now, at the time, I had really never looked it up. Many, many years ago, and I just, you know, went by me. So I decided, well, I'll just check it out. So I told him, I said, well, that, that is indeed a, a good answer, and I appreciate your answer. I'll tell you, I can't tell you the joy that was in my heart when I opened my Hebrew text and found out both lords are Jehovah. I couldn't wait for our next meeting. He came back and I said, I got a little problem with this Isaiah 44, 6 verse you said. Now, you're sure the Redeemer is the Messiah? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, the Redeemer is the Messiah. We know that. And you said that he's called the Lord of hosts here, the Lord of armies. Yes, the Messiah is called the Lord of hosts, but understand that's Adonai. I said, no, it's not. The Hebrew is Jehovah. He said, that can't be. I said, well, it is. And I showed him where it, in the Hebrew text, it's, it's Jehovah in both cases, Yahweh. And he sat there and he said, this is indeed troubling. <laughs> yes, my friends, it is the Lord of hosts, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the Redeemer, who is called the first and the last. Turn back to Revelation again. Remember, this is what we learned in chapter 1, verse 8 of Revelation. When Jesus talks, he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So it's similar and in chapter 21, near the end of the book, and verse 6, it says, He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. But to make sure you understand it's the first and the last, it's chapter 22, verse 13. 
Jesus is speaking. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So there you put those passages together. You realize he's all there is to say. He's the beginning and the end. He's the eternal God, the first and the last. And Jesus is telling this uh, suffering church not to worry because the eternal God is for them. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And then to say he's the resurrected Lord, what encouragement to those who are suffering. And he says to be faithful unto death. Obviously, they're going to experience a tremendous amount of pain, suffering, persecution, and terrible consequences for their faith in Christ. But the resurrected Lord gives us all the encouragement we need. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. Fear the one who can cast both the body and soul into hell. That's who you should fear. But don't fear anybody who can kill your body. Don't fear him at all. Because he is the resurrected Lord. Uh, if, if they kill us, our body, uh, we're going to be resurrected. And we're going to have a brand new body from our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn back to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Who Christ is always makes the difference. John chapter 11. In John 11, verse 25, it says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? What a tremendous statement. Go over to chapter 14, verse 19. Yet a little while, he said to his disciples, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. He's talking about his resurrection. And as Bill Gaither's uh, Alleluia Cantata expresses in one of its songs, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I too shall one day be resurrected into his likeness. You know, there's nothing more powerful upon us at a time of suffering and illness than the resurrection. And this is a kind of a personal thing, um, but it's so powerful, I think it will be a, a blessing to you. The last four years of my mother's life, and she loved the Lord, read the Bible through every year, sometimes two and three times a year. And there are folks here who have visited her in that time and will know what I'm talking about. But in those last four years, she went through enormous suffering and agony. Uh, she was uh, bedridden and uh, just terrible, terrible physical pain. Many, many times screaming out. And sometimes when I'd go there, she would uh, just cry out and say, Why is the Lord leaving me here? Why doesn't he take me home? But in a moment of great suffering and pain, one day when I was there and the doctors and nurses had given her all the medication and drugs they really could and it still wasn't helping her and and uh, the head hospital administrator asked me if I could just try to calm her down and I went in there and I said she was just screaming and yelling terrible pain and uh, I said mother let me, let me read you some scripture and I read her first Thessalonians 4 about the dead in Christ arise first and she was screaming and yelling and and trying to stop, just kind of like, I was just observing how the Lord was quieting her heart. And I kind of finished that passage, and I just kind of stopped and waited. She looked at me, and she said, more. <laughs> <laughs> so I flipped over to 1 Corinthians 15 and read that whole chapter, and I finished, and I started to close my Bible, and she said, more. So I went to Revelation 21 and 22, and I watched how the Lord used his word, the glorious news of the resurrection, to calm her heart. Physically, the pain was so awful. But praise God, one day the pain will be no more. And that day came, and she was ushered into God's presence, absent from the body, present with the Lord. There's fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The good news is not work tomorrow. The good news is you may die tonight. <laughs> now, if you don't know the Lord, that is not good news. <laughs> but if you know the Lord, Paul said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better to be with the Lord. We don't sorrow over those who die in the Lord. Uh, we, we sorrow, but we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. 
If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Do you think this church needed to know about the resurrected Lord? Boy, I'll say they did. They're going to face suffering and trial and persecution and impending death. And they needed to know that he is the one who rose from the dead. And because he is alive, so shall we one day live forever with him. Isn't it great to know the Lord? You're on the winning side, no matter how bum your week is. Amen? Amen. That's great. I mean, your world may be falling apart, but the good news is one day we're going home. Now back to Revelation 2, verse 9. Who he is, number two, what he knows. And he knows four things, according to verse 9. One, I know thy works. And, and this is repeated, as you know, frequently. And I just want to say this to you tonight. I don't know how often I've heard this, but it's been quite a bit where folks get real discouraged about what they do for the Lord. Nobody ever seems to thank them or notice it or whatever, and they think they're so insignificant. Isn't it great just to read over and over again the Lord saying, I know your works. There's never anything you've ever done for the Lord the Lord doesn't know about. And he will not forget what you have done, and he's promised to reward you. Be faithful, weary pilgrims. One day it will be worth it all. No matter who sees what you do, or knows what you're doing for him. God knows what you're doing. Jesus said, I know your works. Secondly, he knows their tribulation. Now, there's several Greek words for tribulation. This is the interesting one that's pressure from without. It's coming from outside. It's not within the camp. It's not in your life. It's not caused by your stress, not being able to handle things. It's talking about persecution coming from other people. Pressure from without. Turn back to Matthew chapter 5. I know your tribulation. They were going through it for their faith in Jesus Christ. It was not easy to be Christian and live in Smyrna. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. Matthew 5, verses 10 to 12. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in his Beatitudes gave this wonderful, wonderful encouragement. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Now I don't know if you've ever um, been criticized or slandered or accused falsely. Um, but I have good news for you. If you live long enough, you will be. <laughs> and uh, when you are, it isn't a pleasant thing. You know, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to answer it. Rumors are always worse than the truth. And you don't know what to do about it. And sometimes you think, man, I, I need to put out a big dissertation and tell the whole world. But my friends, Jesus said, no, just rejoice. Great is your reward in heaven. They persecuted the prophets before you the same way. Now, often we're buffeted for our own faults. We all know what that's about. But I'll tell you, folks, whenever you're criticized, whenever you're slandered, whenever you're persecuted, no matter what context it is, it hurts. Amen? It hurts. I've been amazed because I've been through a lot of that, but I, I've been amazed about how many people right here in the ministry that I've talked to in just the last few weeks, story after story after story, painful experiences, criticism, slander, persecution. It's going on all the time. We got our heads in the sand if you don't think it's going on all the time. What do we do about it? I mean, we always want to defend and... Reminds me of a guy who said to... Talking about my sin, he said, did, did you do that? I said, yeah, but I want you to know I'm, I, I'm, I'm not as sinful as you think. Oh, he said, that's a relief. I said, no, I'm worse than anything you've ever heard. <laughs> you know, folks, um, we need to understand something. Uh, God wants us to suffer. Not many people teach that in discipleship, especially the new converts who are afraid we'll wipe them out. 
But Paul, when he established churches, as according to Acts 14, he admonished those new believers that we got to go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. We're going to go through a lot of hassle, people. And he said, when this happens to you, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And that is not our natural response, is to get all bent out of shape. We can't sleep. The pain is terrible. We don't know what to do. And God says, rejoice, be exceeding glad. Great is your reward in heaven. So persecuted they the prophets who were before you. It's not easy to do, is it? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And look at verse 11 and 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Paul's writing about his own experience here and encouraging Timothy. And it's the last letter he ever wrote. He's in the Mamertine prison. Talk about suffering. You know, I was only down in that dungeon for about 40 minutes. And I, I, I was very uncomfortable. Can't hardly breathe. Um, it's filthy. It stinks to high heavens. It, it's wet and damp. This Mamertine prison where Paul was, where he wrote this, I've been there. Now they have a little staircase, but they didn't have a staircase then. They drop you through a hole, and you're stuck there with the rats. It's rat infested. It's filthy. It's dirty. It stinks to high heavens. It's a sewage hole. You know, it's funny how we read the Bible, but once you go there and you're there, all of a sudden something changes in you. It's not so easy to read through it anymore. And Paul here, who's knowing he's going to be executed, is writing to Timothy to encourage him. He told him earlier that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. But Timothy, you better be ready. Persecution is coming. Pick it up at verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. That's where he was stoned and left for dead. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not an option. It's going to happen. Back to Revelation 2. What does he know? He knows their works. He knows their tribulation. And third, he knows their poverty. But adds this footnote, but you are rich. You know the word poverty? There's, there's several for poor. This happens to be the worst one. It's referring to a beggar who's absolutely destitute, has nothing, zilch. He's begging for food. And these Christians were really going through it. Jesus says, I know your poverty. But he said, don't ever forget, you are rich. It's interesting to me that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it speaks about our Lord. Though he was rich, yet he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Poor in this world, but rich with God. Saw a license plate that said, he who has the most toys when he dies wins. How sick. In Matthew 6, verse 19, the Bible says we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we'll take nothing out. In Matthew 6, 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, this passage doesn't mean a whole lot to you until somebody comes and steals what you got. <laughs> I well remember a neighborhood we lived in many years ago when our kids were small and it was a violent neighborhood. Our kids were often beat up on the way to school, would come home crying and all of that sort of thing. One night, we went out to a very expensive uh, Scottish restaurant, McDonald's. <laughs> and we were only gone about an hour. It, it wasn't longer than that, maybe an hour and a half at the most. And we came back to our house, and there was, um, the lights were on, the doors were open. And the neighbor was standing outside, and I drove in. I don't know what was going on. The neighbor said, 
Well, we didn't know you folks were moving. I said, we're not. He said, well, the movers were here. I said, what do you mean the movers were here? They drove their truck right into our driveway, broke into the house, opened the doors, turned the lights on, even waved to the neighbors who waved back at them. Put all of our furniture, everything. We had an absolute empty house. And would you believe that a Christian neighbor came over and said, lay not up treasures on earth. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> praise God for the word of God. Three times in the same year, we were robbed, cleaned out the house. The furniture was getting worse, of course. I was hitting the thrift stores at that point. Might as well buy it cheap, it was going to go again, you know. You never know what you really think about things, you know, until somebody takes them from you. But you brought nothing into this world and certain you're going to take nothing out. How sweet of our Lord Jesus to say to these people who are suffering so, I know all about your condition. I know you're poverty stricken, but don't ever forget you're rich. You're rich. You have treasures in heaven where moth and rust will never affect uh, Dr. Barnhouse, who taught at uh, Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for so many years, has wonderful commentator, commentaries. Uh, he says this, what matters the frown of the world if we have the smile of God? I kind of like that. What matters the frown of the world if we have the smile of God? Back to Revelation 2. I know your works, I know your tribulation, I know your poverty, and I know the blasphemy that you've endured. Verse 9, I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, please, and look at verse 19. This is a very interesting passage. We want to try to break it down so we understand what's happening here. The blasphemy is, is slander, slander of others. And they were enduring this blasphemy by those who say they were Jews but were not. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 to 23. Here's what it says. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. We're going to be attacked. And Jesus said, I know that people are slandering you. I know people are doing this. But remember, Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile back. When he was threatened, he didn't return it. So often we want to get our pound of flesh. We want to settle the matter. We want to get revenge. We want to straighten matters out. No. No, that's not the way. It never has been. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He said nothing. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and he didn't open his mouth and according to Peter, he suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Now, turn to Romans chapter 2. This blasphemy, we're told, comes from those who say they're Jews, but are not. Now, is he talking about physical descent? No. He's talking about those who are physical Jews, but they aren't spiritually Jewish in their hearts. They had a false claim, in other words. And in Romans chapter 2, Paul dealt with this so many times, but this is a classic passage on who is really a Jew. Romans 2, verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. 
Now remember in circumcision, you cut away the foreskin. And that becomes a metaphor to a Jewish mind when you apply it to the heart. God spoke about circumcision of the heart in the Old Testament. And the foreskin of the heart, so to speak, uh, is talking about all that scar tissue that builds up as a result of sin. So we need to be circumcised in our heart. Uh, Colossians 2 tells us that when Christ died, uh, he took that foreskin, as it were, and nailed it to his cross. And we were literally circumcised in our hearts by the work of Christ. Now he says circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. The number one problem, some have said, the Apostle Paul faced when he was trying to preach the gospel and start churches were people that are often called Judaizers. They were Jewish people who followed the law of Moses, and properly so, and they circumcised on the eighth day their chil children, their boy children, and that was proper to do as well. But they believed that everyone who was circumcised had a guarantee that he would live forever with God and would be in the final resurrection. So circumcision becomes a kind of legalism. You've got to do it in order uh, to be sure of eternal life and be in the resurrection. And Paul, of course, constantly combated that because when the gospel came to the Gentiles, you had multitudes of people, more then than now, where we see circ circumcision from a health point of view, but you had just literally thousands of people coming to Christ who were not circumcised. And these Judaizers were going around saying that Paul is perverting the law of Moses. They need to be circumcised. And he says, no, wait a minute. No, the circumcision God wants is in the heart. And just because you're circumcised outwardly in the flesh does not mean that you're a true Jew. Does not mean you really are believing in the Messiah. For remember that circumcision, my friends, was the sign that the parents believed the messianic hope and the promise to Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant in the Abraham shall all families even Gentiles of the earth be blessed. What is the sign of that covenant? And it was the parents circumcising their child. Circumcision didn't save the child. Circumcision even reflected the faith of the parents. And that's so important. Let me just say that a lot of people who believe in babies being baptized, and maybe you've come from a religious group who does, they based all of their doctrine in history upon the act of circumcision. That as the Jews did that, so we in the church would use baptism. They connect even Colossians 2, a passage about being buried with him in baptism and talking about circumcision as being a clear teaching that circumcision and baby baptism are the same in terms of what they represent. To all of you who have been baptized as babies and believe somehow you're in the in group because of it, let me remind you that it was the faith of the Jewish parents, not the child, that was the issue in circumcision. And maybe your parents baptized you as a baby with their confidence in the Lord and praying that you will someday come to Christ. But if you never put your personal faith in Jesus Christ, you are as lost as any Jew was who had been circumcised but did not believe in the Messiah. It doesn't matter how many times you've been baptized. If you have never come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not saved. You need to be baptized only as an act of obedience to your faith in Jesus Christ. So important. These Jews were therefore troubling the Christians. They didn't want the Christian message. And they said they were Jews, but they are not. And they were slandering the Christians. Go back, please, to Revelation chapter 2. We not only have their false claim, these who are blasph blaspheming the Christians, but we have their true connection. Interesting that Jesus would say they are the synagogue of Satan. I don't know how many of you have Jewish blood, but I'll tell you, I have a great love for the Jewish people, and I know that this is one of the most troublesome passages in all of the Bible. To put the word synagogue with the word Satan is just a little hard to take. But that's what the Bible says. Who is really behind the accusations, the slander. Who's behind it? Revelation 12, 2 says that the devil, Satan himself, is the accuser of the brethren. So sometimes we get upset and ticked off at people that may be slandering or criticizing. Understand the one behind it is the one you should be angry at. It's Satan. 
And he stirs up the brothers and sisters against one another. And he often causes strife and envy and problems. And James speaks about it. And we lose the wisdom of God. And all of a sudden we're in this war with each other. And yet Paul wrote, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So why are we doing it? Why are we fighting each other? We wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, I wonder what would be the effect on all of us if God all of a sudden allowed all of the demons to be visible. We'd probably run for cover. But my dear friends, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Understand that according to the Bible, these folks were the synagogue of Satan. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5 and look at verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. The synagogue of Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, slanderer. That's his nature. That's what it means. The devil is a slanderer. He accuses. He walketh about, he's a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You're not the only one going through it. But the God of all grace, isn't that great? Grace giving us what we don't deserve, who called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect or mature, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Back to Revelation 2. Who he is, what he knows, what he commands. Verse 10. There are two things, two issues that form his commands. One deals with fear and one deals with faithfulness. Revelation chapter 2, one deals with fear, and one deals with faithfulness. Verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Second command, be thou faithful unto death. Now, let's take fear for a moment. I want you to consider the following things in this one verse. We first of all have a prediction of suffering. Did you catch that? Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. You will suffer. I spoke on suffering many years ago. A young man came up afterwards and he said, man, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I've never suffered. I don't know what to say except cheer up, you will. You know, know, folks, we are going to suffer. That's what the Bible says. We're going, but we get so bent out of shape when it comes. We get so surprised. A man who lost his job after 30 years told me, he said, I don't understand why this happened to me. I didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with my company. I don't understand. Somebody, he said, is out to get me. I said, yeah, that's correct. Do you know who it is? I said, yes, I do. Well, how'd you find out? I said, well, I read the Bible. (laughs) Satan is after you. We're all going to suffer. It's just a question of time. Number two, the person behind the persecution of believers. The devil shall cast some of you into prison. The devil is behind it. That's what the Bible says. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now understand, I do not believe, nor am I saying tonight, that all suffering is primarily the result of the work of Satan and demons. The Bible is very clear that we suffer because of our own faults. The Bible is also very clear that we suffer because of the curse. The curse results in our body falling apart, for instance, and we get, uh, as we get older, we, we experience the decay of the body. And we got problems in the body, we got illnesses and sicknesses, and it's not always the result of specific sinning in our life. That was clear from the man born blind in John 9. Um, The disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither, but that the works of God might be manifest in him. So sometimes physical malady is simply the result of the curse 
the fall of man and the curse of the world. And it's not the result of specific sinning in anybody's life. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So we're buffeted for our own faults. We are also experiencing the results of the curse. And I'd like to also add that God is very clear in the word that he sometimes directly causes suffering in the life of our, our uh, believe, believers in the Bible. And you say, wait a minute, I don't understand. You mean God imposes suffering? Yes, absolutely, and says so many times. Why? To wipe you out? No, to make you stronger. God does it for your blessing, not for your destruction. And we need to understand that. But we also have in the Bible a volume of scripture that tells us that Satan uh, is involved. He can inflict physical harm and pain. We learn all the way through the Gospels. Uh, he is even the one who has the power of death that was destroyed in that uh, power of death by Christ's death on the cross. But he is the enemy and he is able to inflict enormous trouble. The demons of hell can cause terrible, terrible persecution, problems, physical problems, emotional problems, and spiritual problems. And the Bible says so. And it's easy to be fearful. Yet Jesus says, fear none of this. Even though the person behind it is Satan, the accuser of the brethren, as Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says. A missionary leader friend who uh, was home on furlough speaking at a missionary conference uh, from South America told me about um, a, a raid of uh, the police in his given city in South America. Uh, they had raided a group of Satanists and um, in the raid they found uh, numerous copies of um, a hit list of Satanists were praying for the destruction and fall of these people. And he handed it to me, this is several years ago, he handed it to me and um, my name was on the list. So was Chuck Smith and many other of your radio friends. They were on this list. This was all the way down in South America. You know, I wonder if we know what's going on. I, I, I don't. I just sometimes say, Lord, <laughs> Help me to understand. I wonder if we realize what's going on. Uh, the devil is working overtime, folks. I was up in Canada and um, ran into a terrible situation of Satanists. Uh, many of them who used to center their efforts in San Francisco moved up to Vancouver Island and began to cause a lot of havoc in uh, British Columbia, the western province of Canada. And in one particular town called Abbotsford, which is near the United States border, there's some powerful churches. For Canada, really great, strong churches. And the Satanists literally targeted that city. And they set up little coven, covens in the shape of a pentagram all over that city of Abbotsford and began to pray for the destruction uh, and failure of all these churches, for division, for strife, and for the fall of their leaders. And in a year's period of time that they were involved, all the three major churches experienced the most amazing divisions in their church. They were all in absolute shock. The devil's not more powerful than God, but I wonder if we are taking seriously the matter of prayer. I read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all men have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil. The Greek has the evil one. And some of the English translations indicate that. The Lord is faithful and establish you and keep you from what? From the evil one. Is that necessary? You bet. Because he's on the prowl as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now go back to Revelation 2. The prediction of suffering, you will suffer this. The person behind it, the devil himself. The purpose of this is that you may be tried. That you may be tested. Why? So you'll be wiped out again? No. The Bible speaks of us being tried like gold in the fire. And we become more beautiful as we go through that testing. Think of an oyster. It becomes a pearl through much irritation. 
How about sandpaper? Isn't a lot of things that we go through like sandpaper? It does cause friction, but it also rounds off the rough edges. Amen? God uses this in our lives to make us what he wants us to be. And what's the period of suffering? Look at verse uh, 10 again. It says, you will have tribulation 10 days. What does that mean? Well, there are three major views. One, that it's the 10 general persecutions under Rome. The problem with this is that Nero, which was the first one, precedes, precedes the date of this message. And the text indicates that the 10 days are still future. So much for that view. A second view is that it refers to the 10 years of persecution that came under Emperor Diocletian. Because out of all the 10 persecutions in Rome of the Christians, one of them lasted for 10 years, 303 to 313 AD. But that's so far removed from this message. And since it says you will suffer uh, soon, you're going to suffer, it seems to me that it's stretching it a little bit to try to prove that point. What does it mean? I believe it means a short time. It's used that way in Genesis, in Job, in Daniel. It's used that way many times. Ten days is an idiomatic expression uh, to the Jewish mind of a short period of time. And I, when I looked at that, I just said, praise the Lord. You can check out Genesis 24, 55, Job 19, 3, Daniel 1, 12. Uh, they use this idiom. And, and the thing that really blessed me is a lot of us, we go through this suffering. We say, when will it ever end? And God in his comfort to them says, it's going to only last just a short time. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, our light affliction, and boy, we go through it sometimes, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, our light affliction is but for a moment and works for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we don't look at the things that are seen, they're temporal. We look at the things that are not seen, they're eternal. It's only going to be a short time. What does he command? Don't be afraid. As to fear, fear none of this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And number two, faithfulness. Be thou faithful unto death. Can you imagine being in that church and hearing this message? You feel like saying, why us? Why not send it over to Laodicea? <laughs> be thou faithful unto death. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You cannot read that message without seeing Polycarp in his 90s being burned at the stake. Be thou faithful unto death. You cannot read it without thinking of hundreds of people, just the result of that one man's testimony, who died for their faith and refused to burn the incense to say Caesar is Lord. Be thou faithful unto death. What does he promise? Let's wrap it up. He promises two things. He promises one, a crown that makes it all worthwhile. A crown of life. Verse 10, I will give thee a crown of life. Is that a martyr's crown like somebody's? as often said and some of the commentators refer to. I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Because in James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation or trial, for when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So all that love him are getting the crown of life. What it's talking about is eternal life. Don't worry what happens to you in this life. What's coming is far better. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things the Lord has prepared for those that love him. Amen? Don't be discouraged, pilgrims. It's going to be worth it all. A crown of life. And the second promise is a consequence that will never be faced, which is the worst consequence any man could face in his life. The second death. We will learn about it in Revelation 20. We mention it now. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here we go through life. We suffer. We're poor. We're being slandered and beat up and tortured and persecuted and being martyred. And God says, don't worry about it. I'll give you the crown of life and you will not be in hell. You will be in heaven. And that will make it worth it all. There is no greater issue to any of us no greater issue 
than to escape hell and to be with God forever. There's no greater issue. There's nothing on your agenda. There's nothing in your plans. Nothing this week you've got that you're thinking about that's any more important than that. It's escaping hell and being in heaven. And the only way is through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other way. Let's pray.